the podcast for the inquisitive diver. During this episode, I speak to marine biologist and shark fanatic Christian Parton. He is the lead author of a recently published scientific paper focusing on the direct impact of microplastics on demersal sharks. This paper is the first of its kind and considered to be a baseline for the future of research into the direct impact of plastics on sharks, or more precisely, in sharks. With the support from Brendan Godley and the University of Exeter, the Shark Trust and Citizen Science, Christian also created the Shark and Ray Entanglement Network, more commonly known as SHARON. SHARON openly invites the global community to aid in their research by reporting any entanglement found, all in a bid to identify the species that may be at more risk, any global hotspots for entanglement, and the types of debris affecting sharks and rays. Join me as I learn more about each subject, Christian, and his future aspirations as a diver and scientist. Christian, welcome to the show, buddy. How are you doing? Very well, thanks, Matt. How are you? I'm not too shabby, not too shabby. I'm at the opposite end of the world, so clearly you're having um, an alcoholic drink while I'm having morning coffee. I definitely have my, uh, my pre-prepared cocktail here because it is seven o'clock here in Florida. So, so I, I feel like the timing works a little bit better for me to have a cocktail than you. Uh, yeah, there'd be a serious problem if I was doing it right now. <laughs> Each to their own. <laughs> oh, dear. OK, so let's let's talk. Let's start off with uh, let's, let's talk about you to start with. Let's let's tell people who you are and what you get up to and why there's a lot of sharks swimming behind you. <laughs> so yeah, my name's Christian Parton. Um, I'm a researcher at the University of Exeter based down in Cornwall in the UK. I'm not there at the moment. I'm actually um, across here in the United States um, visiting family, but um, most of the time I spend down in, down in Cornwall in the UK. Um, and my research has been involved with sharks now for probably the best part of the last three years or so. So um, yeah, I've, I've been I've been doing shark research for a, a long time. I've loved sharks for such a long time, and and it's what I've I've always wanted to do. Um, and for those listening at home, we're on we're on a Zoom call at the moment. I've got a lovely little green screen behind me of some scalloped hammerhead sharks from the Galapagos. So yeah, I'm not I'm not visually. jealous at all. <laughs> you can see my refrigerator behind me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's the contrast has got. You need one of these one of these green screens behind you i know i keep telling the missus i need to buy a new computer but i also want a new dry suit so Ooh. um it's, this... it's a tough one probably <laughs> the dry suit is gonna is gonna uh, benefit you more i'd think oh, yeah well you know i'm hoping that you know at some point someone will sponsor me and that'll do <laughs> <laughs> um okay so this um th this paper that we're going to talk about um i've had a good read on it as well it's it's super cool i must say and 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 much. And, and rather geeky to the scientific level that I had to, you know, use the dictionary and look at quite a few words, but there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes, sometimes we, we have to throw in a few, uh, a few big words in there and, and, and hope people <laughs> Google them or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. Yeah, there was a lot of Googling going on. Um, okay, so how did, it, how did it come about? I mean, you, you, you're working as a, a researcher at the University of Exeter. Was this a paper that you were working on for a degree or was it something post-education? Yeah, so I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Exeter um, in zoology. Um, so quite a, a, a broad spectrum of, of understanding. I knew that I was always um, more interested in the marine side of things. Um, but having that broad understanding in zoology, I think is quite important um, for me kind of going into the future and, and, and not sort of specialising too much too soon. Um, and so at the end of that undergraduate degree, I decided to stay on and, and do what's called a master's by research, which is essentially like a, a mini PhD. Um, and I was kind of thinking about things that I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to do something on um, shark species, uh, but what that was going to be was was um, up to me. So I, I really started doing some digging. And I think we all know how big a problem plastic pollution is and how prominent it's been in the media now for at least the last five years or so. I think Blue Planet 2, when that came out, the uh, the David Attenborough BBC TV series, that really kind of shone a light 
um, on the impact of plastic pollution in the marine environment. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of grown as a, a science industry really in the last five years or so kind of exponentially we, we have so many scientists now who are looking at the the effects of plastic pollution across a broad range of species but I kind of decided to pair the two together so my, my passion for sharks and plastic pollution um, and I, I, I didn't really know that much about it we, we didn't kind of understand whether plastic pollution was impacting sharks at all other than you know a few anecdotal reports here and there so it was a case of trying to find a sort of a knowledge gap in the scientific literature and, and to then fill that knowledge gap um, and, and to really look into it in, in further detail. And, and we started to find you know, more and more about it and, and it ended up actually being quite shocking. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was looking through that report that you've come up with. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of, it kind of left me with, well, lots of, thought routes to be honest but um you kind of assume nowadays that um the aquatic life in our oceans are affected by plastics in some form or another mm -hmm. but to read that you you're able to collect the information and, and, and the, the evidence of these plastics from within sharks and decide where it's originated from it's just i think it's pretty damn outstanding work yeah, I mean, it was a it was a challenge. There's no question about it, and, yeah. and that largely came down to the fact that the reporting of it is not standardised and hasn't been standardised at all. Mm. So we're essentially relying on dribs and drabs throughout the throughout the literature, um, and then it's a case of uh, you know literally scrolling through and bringing them all together in one place, and then looking at that data set. Um, and trying to find patterns and trying to see, um, you know, different, you know, potentially different entangling materials or, or different entanglement hotspots around the world. And, mm. and to collate that all together was, uh, you know, a challenge. There's no question about it, but I absolutely loved doing it. I, it was, it was really, really fun to do um, mm. <laughs> after the, <laughs> the kind of initial data collection part went and, and, and we really got stuck into the data. It was, um, it was interesting to see definitely so how, how did you get the data as well because i mean you, you've got this concept of i want to research sharks and plastics in this in their stomachs all this kind of stuff how on earth did you do it in such a manner that's you know not harmful and, and not offensive to the ecosystem so the two kind of uh, papers that i had throughout the the masters by research one uh, specifically focused on entanglement um, within plastic debris uh, so that's, you know, sharks that have been swimming along and they've got something caught on them or they're, or they're caught in something uh, like ghost fishing gear, for example. Um, and then the other paper was looking at the ingestion of microplastics. So mm. both papers sort of both fell under the umbrella of uh, plastic pollution, but that's two very different issues. Mm. So in terms of the, the uh, microplastic ingestion stuff, we were essentially relying on um, sharks that had been caught as bycatch uh, in a fishery down in Cornwall. So it wasn't a case of us kind of going out and just slinging a load of sharks out of the ocean <laughs> and cutting them up. <laughs> Unfortunately, the sharks are, are caught as, as bycatch in this fishery. Um, yeah. And more often than not, uh, they're just going to be sold cheapest chips on a market or thrown overboard because they're almost worthless mm. um so it was it was literally a case of me i remember i went down to um to penzance which is a fishing town um in cornwall uh, probably about 10 o'clock in the morning to go and meet with um with a fisherman and i remember i drove down um yeah, yeah, about 9 30, 10 o'clock, and I was meeting this fisherman in a pub. He'd just come back in after a week at sea. Obviously, he's going to the pub, mm. um, regardless of what time what time it is. So I, I remember I I, um, I drove down, walked into this pub, and it's a proper hardy fisherman's pub. You know, they've got yeah. things on the wall, the pictures on the wall. And I walk in, and you know, three fishermen who were sat at the bar kind of turn around and look at me. 
and I'm just this <laughs> skinny boy in tight jeans and a super dry t-shirt. And they're thinking, who is this guy? Who is this guy? And I, I asked the, um, the lady working behind the bar for, for Alan, the fisherman that I was meeting, and he's outside having a cigarette with his pint at 10 o'clock in the morning. And, um, it was just one of those situations that I found myself in where I was like, this is, this is such a bizarre, <laughs> bizarre yeah. scenario. Um, but we sat and we chatted, um, and he was super keen for uh, to be involved in in the research and and really really wanted to help out and and then I, I essentially relied on on him for getting those getting those shark samples and then it was a case of every so often driving down to Penzance sticking six seven eight sharks in the boot of my car and driving them back up to the university and getting them in the freezers before they uh, before they thawed out which was another <laughs> seriously strange um scenario to have is <laughs> me driving my car from Penzance back to Falmouth which is a good you know 40 45 minute drive yeah. with eight sharks in the boot of the car just, <laughs> just absolutely bizarre um, but to have someone like Alan who is um you know a, a, a fisherman who's worked in the industry for over 35 years um mm. was something that was was really important and he was fundamental uh for me getting the, the samples that I needed for those sharks. Yeah, yeah. Has he, um, just, just picking up on there, you said he'd been in the industry for 35 years. <laughs> did, he, did, did he have any kind of comments on, um, you know, how, how fishing has changed over those years that he's he's been operating? Yeah, I think if you spoke to most people working in the fishing industry now, um, they would have something to say about the fishing industry. Um, of course, it's changed so much over the years purely from a, a gear perspective so the the type of equipment that they're using has changed and and they're they're you know getting so much more ability to find fish easily mm. um so from from that perspective it's changed so much but also from um a sort of political perspective as well um i think you know, with everything that's going on politically in the UK with Brexit um, means that the the scope for fishing is is continuously changing and, and a lot of them don't really know what to expect in the coming years. And, and I think he, he expressed some concern uh, regarding that. Um, but it's one of those things where, you know, he just has to wait and see because you have no idea what, what it's going to be like in six months time, a year's time, five years time. You just don't know. So I think yeah. he, he did express some concerns um, about that. But, um, but having worked in the industry for so long, he's managed to build his career up to the point where, you know, he, he's, he's fairly secure in, in, in the work that he does and mm. can provide for you know, the crew that he has um, and, and his family as well. Yeah. Yeah, comfortable enough to go to the pub when he gets off the boat. <laughs> it depends how long he's going to be staying in that pub for, how many pints he wants. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, we didn't introduce Sharon, and I when, I when I was looking through your bits and pieces on online, I kind of assumed that the um, research paperwork on the, um, you know, the ingestion of plastics came before Sharon. Um, but you just so it was really... actually, yeah, it was actually the other way around. The other way around. So yeah, Sh Sh Sharon and the entanglement. So for those um, at home, Sharon is not a person. Um, <laughs> Sharon is a uh, citizen science project. Um, Sharon is an acronym that stands for the Shark and Ray Entanglement Network. And that was sort of um, uh, my brainchild that came of that first entanglement paper. Um, so when we were when we were writing the paper, initially we had written somewhere towards the towards the bottom that there could be the scope for some kind of um, online recording method for people where they could kind of submit their sightings of entangled sharks. Um, and I thought to myself, well, why can't we do that? We could make that. We could make that. Um, that software and, and, and that project. And, mm. and so we, um, we approached the Shark Trust, who are a fantastic shark charity based um, in Plymouth in the UK, and kind of came to them and said, look, you know, we've got this idea. Um, we'd, we'd love to have you guys on board with it. And, and they were very, very keen to be uh, involved in it. And Sharon was born. And Sharon's been ticking over now for probably the last, I would say, 
year and a half, maybe just under a year and a half, okay. um, and has been collecting recordings of uh, shark and ray entanglements all over the world. Um, and it's amazing to see some of those coming in. I think at the moment we're stood at something like 150, maybe just shy of 150 uh, shark or ray entanglement reports, mm. um, which is more than we found in the scientific literature um, from like the 1940s to, to present day, and also more than we found on Twitter as well, which was part of the um, part of the searching that we did in that paper. Yeah. Um, so it it's just a kind of another thing that's showing that this issue is probably happening at far higher levels than we think it is. And so we need to get that data in to, to prove that it's happening mm. at higher levels. And if we can prove that it's happening at higher levels and where it's happening at higher levels and perhaps what uh, debris types these animals are being entangled in, then we can start putting in policies to try and reduce that impact and and that's the most important thing that's what we want out of this is is we want this to be less common than it is at the moment but we can't do that until we know how common it is and mm. where it is and 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 all these different different factors so mm. that that was essentially what the purpose of of Sharon was was to was to collect to collect more data and it's doing its job I, I think it's a fantastic idea. I mean, the amount of diving that I do and have done over the years, um, I, I, I can't emphasize how common it is to see uh, large pelagic fish either wrapped in fishing lines on nets or hooks hanging out of their faces. Um, it's just so common. In fact, when I, when I first saw Sharon, when we, when we initially started speaking a few weeks ago, um, I immediately tagged a, a couple of friends, Jason, uh, Jason Fondish from Nusa Panida, who's um, on the show um, mm. an episode or two ago uh, with his manta rescue. Um, it, it's just so, so common. And I think it's the, uh, it's, prob it's probably the naivety of the, the common people that, you know, you don't see it, so it doesn't happen. Um, yeah. So definitely. I think Sharon's and a great platform to make people wake up to it, the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And and that's what what we want. And you know, me having that conversation with you led to two more entanglement sightings that mm. we have on the database. We need eyes. We need eyes, and the best people to you know see that are divers. Mm. Divers see this thing sometimes on a daily basis, mm. and to have more eyes on the issue, and to have more people kind of redirecting other people towards Sharon and, and spreading the message and saying, look, you know, we, we've seen this entanglement incident. Um, oh, you can report that to, to this citizen science project to have those almost, almost foot soldiers essentially mm. um, out in the field, the people who are seeing this to have those people on board and to have those people um, know about what Sharon is and, and, and what we're trying to achieve is, is going to be fundamental for the success mm. of the, of the project, because mm. Without those eyes and without those those foot soldiers out there, we're just not going to get the reports. Yeah. Um, because you know, there's no way that I'm going to I have the capacity to be able to see everything that's going on in the world <laughs> regarding shark and ray entanglements. But if I have a network of people that can see it and and find it and report it, that's the whole purpose of the project. Yeah, yeah. All right, good on you. Well, let's see if we can push it out a little bit more and make it more uh, globally aware. Um, you can give me all the hashtags and stuff like that at the uh, at, at, towards the end of the the chat, and we'll uh, definitely we'll, yeah we'll, we'll get them in a description. We're uh, we're so active on um, Twitter with Sharon at the moment, so that's the the main platform that we're using currently mm. to sort of push the um, push the project. But as we get bigger, we're going to go across mm. all the social media platforms onto Facebook and to Instagram, yeah. um, just because that will increase our reach to to people around the world. And and the more people we reach, you know, the more the more data we're going to get. And mm. That's why citizen science projects are such an amazing tool for for us scientists because how could you not want more data and and more people collecting that data and and it's a it's a way for the general public to also actively engage with science itself sure. so um you know a lot of people think well you know what what can i do 
Mm. Um, you know, I, I work my nine to five, I'm in an office or something like that. But, mm. you know, if you scroll through social media, sometimes you might spot something online. You might spot a random entanglement that, that you know, none of us have seen yet. And redirecting mm. that to us is exactly what we want. Yeah. And that's um, the thing. It, do, it doesn't have to be recorded by the individual who's reporting it. It's just making you guys aware that the video footage is there. Yeah, exactly. If if people you know don't really want to send you know the link to Sharon to to a report that they've spotted, they can literally tag us, and we will we will do that work. That's what we're we're wanting. We just we want to be made alert to to these you know sightings that are appearing across the social media channels. Mm. And it's one of those things where uh, social media often gets a lot of flack, deservedly so in some cases. Uh, you know that is for sure, but it can be used as this really, really powerful tool yeah. to kind of uh, generate data. Um, the, the data that's available on social media sites at the moment is astronomical. Yeah. Um, and, it, and finding a way to, to get our teeth into that data is something that's going to be really important yeah. uh, moving into the future. Well, I'll, I'll help as much as I can. I mean, I've got, uh, well, we're just making a website for this podcast and I've got a website for my uh, travel agency scuba diving travel agency so mm -hmm. um over to you on that one chap you can you can write a blog article all about it and i'll post it on both websites for you <laughs> i'm more than happy to write <laughs> a blog for you of course um oh i also i have to pass on uh, huge thanks from angal tani who's the dive master in komodo um he was over the moon to see his uh, his video has helped Definitely. I mean, he really, really had a had a go trying to get that uh, trying to get that line off the um, off the manta ray. If anyone hasn't seen that video yet, very very impressive yeah. video. Um, and now we have that we have that data um, on on Sharon, and and it's going to be used in the future to to help inform policy. And yeah. you know, what more could you want? Well, the, the shorter version shows Engel getting dragged around somewhat. But uh, did you see the the, <laughs> the 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 entire footage where the, the manta kept coming back to the surface to? to wait to get freed up it's fantastic yeah it's it, yeah, i mean it just shows you as well how intelligent these animals mm. are um they i've been so lucky enough to swim with um or scuba dive sorry with manta rays um on the east coast of africa before and it is you can see it in their eyes as they as they swim past and kind of you know they're, they're checking you out with that with mm. that massive eyeball you know there is something else going on inside that animal's head mm. and you know that there's something more there than it just being another fish was um east coast of africa was it was that uh, the megafauna foundation yeah so i was um i was at a project called all out africa which is in mozambique mm -hmm. um and we were partnered really really closely with mmf um and yeah they had like a little little base right next to the all out africa base um so and that was back when i was a a little young whippersnapper 18 19 year old and and getting out and and learning how to dive um i think i did my advanced my paddy advanced over water there in mozambique and what a place to do it in terms of the megafauna that we had the opportunity to see it was unbelievable um yeah, and the, the MMF guys are doing great stuff over there. Incidentally, where did where did diving start for you? So diving started for well, officially started. It was actually uh, in Mozambique back when I was, I think I was fifteen. I was on holiday with my parents, and my dad um, had been scuba diving for for a number of years, and he, I think, he was advanced at the time, and and was really uh, trying to uh, co coax me into it. Um, I think I, I was a little bit apprehensive at first because I've sometimes had problems with my sinuses. So I didn't know how equalizing was going to go. Um, but I went out on one of those, um, I can't remember what they're called, sort of like a taster dive thing where you do a little bit in the pool and then they take you out with the instructor who kind of holds your yeah. tank. Um, and we, we, we went out, we went out together and, and that was my first ever dive, um, which was amazing. And, and it's actually incidentally where I saw my first ever shark species. <laughs> Um, which was an oceanic white tip 
that just came cruising out of nowhere. And I was kind of looking along the bottom, not really paying attention. And my instructor who's got me by the back of the tank is shaking me, <laughs> pointing and saying, look, look at this shark. Um, and I, I just saw it come cruising towards us and then just sort of shifted off um, in, in the opposite direction. But it was just an unbelievable experience and, and my first experience of a shark. And I think that's where the, the love of sharks also was just solidified from from being a kid and playing with sharks in the bathtub yeah. to seeing a real one in the water that passion and and that love for for those animals just just grew stronger and then after that taster dive i loved the diving so much that i um i did my open water qualification in falmouth in cornwall nice. which was a <laughs> significantly less sharks um although i did again see um a lesser spotted dogfish on one of my one of my first uh, first dives over there which is now uh, or was now one of my study species for the microplastic ingestion okay. so um seeing seeing that again you know in in falmouth was amazing and and just solidifying that that love for sharks mm. because it's not often you get to see them and and i've learned that over the years now i've uh, as the years have gone on, I feel like I've just been terribly unlucky with shark sightings. I seem to barely see them oh. um, out in the natural environment. You need, you need to get in the water right now back in the UK. Um, I was speaking with um, Paul Toomer, who's the president of Raid, mm. and he lives down in, I think it's Dorset, uh, Dorset Cornwall, something like that. But he, he, he was saying that the, the, the diving at the moment is just ridiculously good. And there's been countless sightings and constant sightings of blue sharks off the coast. Yeah, so blue sharks uh, down in Cornwall, I think a lot of people actually don't realise we, we, we get blue mm. sharks um, in the UK and, and they're a seasonal summer, summer visitor. Um, and there you can see them off the coast of Penzance, you can see them off the coast of Newquay, you know, a few, a few miles offshore. And I, every time I have been on a trip to see the blue sharks and get in the water with them, I have not had the opportunity to do it. <laughs> I've either seen them at the surface and they've gone or, or I've like missed them by a day or something. It's, I'm, I'm devastated by it because seeing all these, all these images at the moment, um, I, I actually worked on a, a project called the UK Blue Shark Project for about a year or so um, collecting some data for them and went out a couple of times with them and just just got terribly terribly unlucky with with the sightings and and have never really managed to get in the water with them so being over here in florida at the moment and seeing oh, uh, you know i've got friends who are posting pictures with them i see the dive companies are and it's just enraging yeah. And all the time, everyone's looking at you going, oh, he's in Florida. It's going to be great diving. But you're jealous of what's back home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's how it goes, isn't it? That's how it goes every time. I just, I think I'm super unlucky. But so I think it's, it's given me a, a bit more of an appreciation for actually seeing a shark uh, in its natural environment. Because now I know uh, how, how rare that is and, and how special that, that can be. So every time I see one now, it, it feels like the first yeah. time. Um, so, um, circling back, we're digressing. We're starting to talk about sharks and diving. They, they, your papers, let's go back to your papers. What's, what's the future for these now? Clearly, Sharon is going to be an ongoing thing and hopefully uh, ever expanding as well. But thinking back to your other paper on the ingestion of plastics, is there, a, is there a, an end game to that one or is, it, is that going to be a continual open book as well? Yeah, I think that's definitely going to be um, an open book. So the the purpose of the microplastic ingestion paper was to provide this, um, what we call an empirical baseline. So um, that's a baseline of microplastic ingestion based on evidence and, and data. Um, and so we wanted to have this, this sort of empirical, empirical baseline for these UK shark species. And so it means now that as work progresses on these species in and around the UK and also other parts of the world where they're found as well, the paper can act as a sort of direct comparison for anyone else who's doing research on a similar issue and they can compare their results to, to, um, to what we've found. Um, but at the moment, I'm taking a little bit of a, a, a break from it. My, my master's by research is finished. I've submitted my thesis, um, so that's all done. But it's something that I would 
without a shadow of a doubt love to go back to and investigate further at some point in the future because there are still a lot of unknowns with it we don't know how these fibers might be impacting the sharks um, at, at a molecular biological level uh, we're trying to kind of figure that out at the moment for a lot of different species mm. so to, to 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 know what those effects are on the sharks is going to be really important to assess how much of a threat it is um, we know that ingestion of microplastics and other forms of fibers uh, has shown consequences on you know internal systems of other fish species for example their immune system or their endocrine system so it's had effects on other fish, but we need to start finding out whether the same thing is happening with the shark species. Mm. At the moment, we don't quite know. So to find that out is going to be uh, a very, very important next step and is something that I would love to do again with the species that, um, that I worked with. But I'm, I'm almost 100% sure that someone is doing something somewhere mm on sharks and microplastics. I know that I, I had a listen to the podcast a few weeks back and um, you mentioned MMF in Indonesia. Mm. And I know um, there's a, a great scientist over there, um, Elitza Germanoff, who's, do, who's done some brilliant uh, microplastics work with manta rays. Um, so there is stuff going on at the moment and, and this, this field is going to grow and we're going to get more knowledgeable on the issue as as the years go by mm, yeah and i suppose um if anything it needs a little bit of direction to pull it all together yeah yeah definitely we you know we we always need a, a direction and and we always want to to have new questions mm. to to answer as as scientists that's something that we love doing we love you know answering new questions and, and then finding new questions from those answered questions and, and that's how science continually evolves and, and progresses um, I couldn't tell you the number of new questions that this second paper posed for me that I could I could probably do two PhDs <laughs> if, I, if I had the opportunity the opportunity to answer answer all the questions that um, I that I wanted to, to, to yeah answer. I mean when you think about it there's a there's a million a million LinkedIn questions to it, isn't there? But I think one of the one of the most important things to point out at this moment, uh, you know, we're talking about two papers and two researchers to do with sharks. And most people who listen to the podcast will probably be fully aware already. But for those that aren't, sharks are the apex predator in our oceans. And without the sharks to clean up, I say clean up, we're not cleaning up the plastics, we're cleaning up the dead and decaying fish that can um, create infection within the other aquatic life that's there so the sharks are there as for want of a better phrase as the janitors of the ocean and, and cleaning them up and keeping them healthy exactly no you're you're absolutely right sharks play a fundamental role in the ocean ecosystem like you said they um they predate on injured on diseased individuals and that keeps those those populations healthy mm. and you know, if, if sharks uh, begin to struggle, and they are struggling, they're one of the most threatened species in the mm. oceans. If we start to lose sharks from our oceans, that's going to have knock-on impacts yeah. all the way down that food yeah. chain. There's no question about it. Um, but not only is it going to have consequences for the ecosystem and marine life, it's also going to have consequences for us humans as well. Um, we, we depend on sharks to keep fish populations healthy and, and, and that promotes um, you know, fisheries industries. But we also depend on sharks for things like ecotourism. Mm. Ecotourism brings in millions and millions of pounds to countries every single year because people love to go and scuba dive and, or, or snorkel with, with large megafauna like sharks and, and rays. And losing those from areas can have catastrophic impact on on a country's economy Definitely. there's no question about Definitely. it I, I was lucky enough to work in Papua New Guinea a few years ago and the location I was based at uh, Oro province um, on the on the northern mm -hmm. coast and the um, the resultant factor of, of overfishing of sharks along that um, coastline was very very clear because we had the coastline and then a few kilometers out was uh, a band of reefs and beyond that was another band of reefs. Um, now the, the location itself is very, very remote. So it's only fished by um, local indigenous people 
that, uh, that you know there's no running water there's no electric there's very few electric boats everything's done by uh, manual outrigger boats you know rowing out to to do the, mm -hmm. the catch so those areas that are very close to land and the shoreline had very minimal aquatic life and quite a lot of almost like fungal overgrowth on the coral reefs etc they weren't very clean at all you go five mm -hmm. kilometers offshore and the reefs became a lot cleaner and the aquatic life got a little bit bigger and more variety but those that were 20 kilometers offshore where the the guys the local guys couldn't row out that far every day it didn't get infected by the overfishing so it had the hammerheads that we could see floating around behind your head it had <laughs> the the great you know the the oceanic white and black tips uh, silkies everything um, and it was almost mm -hmm. as though the further you went out the further you were going back in time because man wasn't destroying it and effectively you know yeah. it it's it's a perfect example of of how we're kind of cocking everything up um and hopefully yeah. we we have direct impacts there's no there's no yeah, question yeah um and hopefully stuff all the great stuff that you're doing and you know people such as yourself that are reporting on this stuff can actually start to sink into people's heads and when we start making a difference yeah for sure i think i i probably i have to stress so in terms of um threats to sharks globally plastic pollution um you know looking at entanglement and ingestion is not the number one threat mm -hmm. to sharks it's not the number two threat to sharks it's a it's a good distance down that list um of threats without a shadow of a doubt overfishing and bycatch is the number one threat to sharks globally um, and i have i have to 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 stress that to everyone because um I, I although what i'm researching is is important and we do need to understand the variety of different threats that these animals face we also should be focusing um efforts on trying to reduce the damaging impact of things like overfishing and bycatch and then after that you look at things like shark finning um you know for for traditional medicines um in certain parts of the world um and then maybe you're looking at things like climate change so so plastic pollution does fall down um a little bit lower on on the list compared to um compared to those threats so yeah we we, we definitely need to we need to look at these threats in a with a broader uh, picture really and, and and kind of realize that that overfishing is is a serious serious issue for sharks and that will be the reason we start losing mm. them from from the oceans yeah, much like the so-called shrimp boats that are down in galapagos right now yeah shocking looking at that is just absolutely devastating i mean i i i know um several scientific uh, researchers um who have been or are in um the galapagos at the moment one of my good friends jade she was there uh, for nine months or so and she is absolutely livid yeah. about yeah. it livid and rightfully yeah. so rightfully so um i don't know how they can they can get away with with what they're doing there but supposedly they are yeah i can only th i can only assume that it's money that talks but um you know that footage you've got behind your head i've got my very own footage that's just like that from Darwin's Arch and we're meant to be there this October it's not happening so hopefully next October um, we won't see too much of a devastating hit on it I'll just keep my fingers crossed and wait patiently to find out Darwin's Arch mm. you need to go what a beauty of a beauty of a site I'd love to get there you know it's 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 a weird way of diving because everything's lava rock um, you, and strong <laughs> strong currents um, you literally bail in and just negative descent off the um off the dinghy down to about five six meters um hide behind some rocks and then descend to 15 20 meters and just clamp onto some lava rock you're not going to destroy anything <laughs> um but you, cl you clamp on and just sit there and have that um that sight of all the schooling hammerheads just whizzing around for the entire dive you don't have to move it's 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 just the the idea of it uh, just excites me far too much i i can't and i will get there one day there's no question i will get yeah. there um i also love the the uh, the negative entry as well uh, we did negative entries in in mozambique and and it's almost you have that sort of paratrooper feeling as you're all kind of sailing yeah. down yeah oh it's epic it's epic 
In fact, I, I, I saw my first tiger shark there last year. Um, we went, instead of an expedition, we went on holiday, me and the missus, and um, it was Darwin's Arch. And we'd done a few dives on the arch itself and decided to go and do one just around the corner, a little bit quieter on the current front. Um, and it's a, a, a large uh, sand area, and I mean large, it's well over the size of a football pitch. But there's huge turtles all just chilling out on the sand and having a siesta. And lo and behold, you know, the missus is just ahead of me and she starts waving frantically. And I thought, oh, okay, it's another, it's another turtle, don't mind. And I just see this broad, almost grimace kind of face coming through the, the through the water. <laughs> oh, is it? Is it? Oh, yes. And <laughs> she was gorgeous, you know, about four meters in length yeah. and back on the boat and spoke to the DM. I was like, oh, it's the first, first tiger I've seen. Um, he said, oh, how big? I said, oh, it's about three and a half, four meters, something like that. He said, oh, that's the female. The male's bigger. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> wait to get back in the water and find him. It's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, where there's where there's turtles, you will find tigers. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, get someone to fund you some research in the Galapagos, mate, and you can come on the trip next October with us, lot. <laughs> that sounds like a really, really good idea. I'm sure we can squeeze <laughs> you on the boat. <laughs> yeah, I'm only little. <laughs> Is there any other subjects that you want to have a quick chat about before we start wrapping the show up? If if you start me talking about more sharks, I will not stop. <laughs> that is the problem. I will not stop. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, um, just give us a rundown then on how people can you know follow you, follow the research that's going on, find the links to everything that we've spoken about. So yeah, you can follow um, all the stuff that I am doing um, on Twitter. So my um, Twitter handle is at KJ Parton. I'm really, really active on there, always um, tweeting about science, uh, science communication, always tweeting about sharks and the research uh, that I'm doing as well. You can find Sharon on Twitter too, um, under the uh, handle at Shark Entangle. Um, and on there, you will find all the links um, that you need to report sightings um, on the Shark Trust's official website. So you can just click through that. Um, if you wanted to, to go on the Shark Trust website as well to find it that way, there are signposts all over the place for Sharon on the Shark Trust website. So you can follow, follow the links through there. Um, Sharon is going to be uh, eventually migrating across to the other social media platforms. So as and when it does, I'm sure you will hear all about that um, on the Twitter page um, but yeah please please do follow um, please spread the word we want as many eyes as we can get out there and and we want we want to hear from you um, if you if you see shark entanglements um, in person or if you have seen them in the past and have you know have a picture or or, or have any sighting please please report it um, and the same applies for you in the future as well. If you see a shark or a ray that's been entangled, please, please get in touch um, and we can get that sighting submitted. And then just, yes, yeah, spread spread knowledge about the um, about the Citizen Science Project. The more people we, we have that, that know about it, the more data we're going to get and the more of a success this project is going to be. So, yeah, that's at Shark Entangle on Twitter um, and at KJ Parton on Twitter as well, um, if you want to follow me. Lovely stuff. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Christian. It was, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and I wish you every success and look forward to lots of new papers that you're going to come up with. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Thanks so much for, uh, for having me, Matt. It's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, the pleasure's all mine, buddy. You take care and speak soon. This is Scuba Go Go Under the Sea, the podcast for the inquisitive diver. <laughs> <laughs>